Well, good morning, guys, from the chicken box. <laughs> there they are. Some little chickies hanging out in the box. Uh, that'll be our soundtrack in the background today as we work on our assignment. <laughs> the, uh, the Delcourt family chickens, they're a week old now. All right, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to work on uh, our final reading and reflection assignment of the year. It would not be right to finish out the year without uh, taking a look at this one. Um, it absolutely is good stuff for both forestry and wildlife, and this is kind of where we, we uh, melt the two worlds together. So this is the Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, um, as usual. And we're going to read a short story today called A Mighty Fortress. It's one of my favorites in the entire book. Um, so follow along with me today as we read. Uh, we'll have a short little reflection to do at the end, and I'm going to help you with that reflection as we go. I'll identify some of the stuff that you need to do uh, in your writing. So follow along with me. Easy peasy. We'll get this done. So uh, every farm, woodland, in addition to yielding lumber, fuel, and posts, should provide its owner a liberal education. This crop of wisdom never fails, but it is, also, but it is not always harvested. I here record some of the many lessons I have learned in my own woods. Soon after I bought the woods a decade ago, I realized that I had bought almost as many tree diseases as I had trees. My woodlot is riddled by all the ailments wood is heir to. I began to wish that Noah, when he loaded up the ark, had left the tree diseases behind, but it soon became clear that these same diseases made my woodlot a mighty fortress, unequaled in the whole county. My woods is headquarters for a family of coons. Few of my neighbors have any. One Sunday in November, after a new snow, I learned why. The fresh track of a coon hunter and his hound led up to a half-uprooted maple, under which one of my coons had taken refuge. The frozen snarl of roots and earth was too rocky to chop and too tough to dig. The holes under the roots were too numerous to smoke out. The hunter had quit coonless because a fungal disease had weakened the roots of the maple. The tree, half-tipped over by a storm, offers an impregnable fortress for coondom. Without this bomb-proof shelter, my seed stock of coons would be cleaned out by hunters each year. So he's writing this, remember, in the early 1900s when raccoon hunting would have been a much uh, bigger endeavor. More people did it because coon fur was worth a lot of money back then. Not so much anymore. Very rare to find people that, that raccoon hunt anymore. All right, back to our story here. My woods houses a dozen ruffed grouse. Those are partridge, right? In Maine, we call those partridge. A dozen ruffed grouse. Periods of deep snow, my grouse shift to my neighbor's woods where there is better cover. However, I always retain as many grouse as I have oaks wind thrown by summer storms. These summer windfalls keep their dried leaves and during snows, each such windfall harbors a grouse. The droppings show that each grouse roosts, feeds, and loafs for the duration of the storm within the narrow confines of his leafy camouflage, safe from wind, owl, fox, and hunter. The cured oak leaves not only serve as cover, but for some curious reason are relished as food by the grouse. These oak windfalls are of course diseased trees. Without disease, few oaks would break off, and hence few grouse would have, would have down tops to hide in. So he's talking about those big tops off the oak trees that blow down during winter storms or during summer storms and then provide winter cover for his rough grouse or partridge. Diseased oaks also provide another apparently delectable grouse food, oak galls. A gall is a diseased growth of new twigs that have been stung by a gall wasp while tender and succulent. In October, my grouse are often stuffed with oak galls. Uh, and let me show you an oak gall real quick. Let's pause right there real quick. I just want to show you an oak gall. Uh, you guys will find these in the woods around here. They look like a green ping pong ball. They fall off an oak tree. And they're, well, this is what all the Leopold's talking about, an oak gall. There you go. There's a good one. Uh, and that is formed by a gall wasp, a little bug that stings the bud of an oak tree and actually... Uh, lays an egg in there and its grub develops inside the bud and the oak tree makes that gall around it to protect the rest of the tree from that little grub and those things will fall off every now and then and he's talking about how grouse love to eat those things i remember finding them as a kid and having no idea what they were uh, until later on in life realizing what they are so i love sharing that with people each year the wild bees load up one of my hollow oaks with combs and each year trespassing honey hunters harvest the honey before i do this is partly because they are more skillful than I am at lining up the bee trees and partly because they use nets and hence are able to work before the bees become dormant in fall. But for heart rots, there would be no hollow oaks to furnish wild bees with oaken hives. So he's saying without hollow trees, there'd be nowhere for bees to, to reproduce and, and build their hives. 
During high years of the cycle, there's a plague of rabbits in my woods. They eat the bark and the twigs off almost every kind of tree or bush I'm trying to encourage and ignore almost every kind I should like to have less of. <laughs> so he's kind of complaining about rabbits there, killing the trees he likes and, and leaving the ones he wishes they would thin out. When the rabbit hunter plants himself a grove of pines or an orchard, the rabbit somehow ceases to be a game animal and becomes a pest instead. The rabbit, despite his omnivorous appetite, is an epicure in some respects. He always prefers a hand-planted pine, maple, apple, or wahoo to a wild one. He also insists that certain salads be preconditioned before he dines to eat them. Thus, he spurns red dogwood until it is attacked by oyster shell scale, after which the bark becomes a delicacy, to be eagerly devoured by all the rabbits in the neighborhood. A flock of a dozen chickadees spends the year in my woods. In winter, when we are harvesting diseased or dead trees for our fuel wood, the ring of the axe is a dinner gong for the chickadee tribe. They hang in the offing, waiting for the tree to fall, offering pert commentary on the slowness of our labor. When the tree at last is down and the wedges begin to open up its contents, the chickadees draw up their white napkins and fall to. Every slab of dead bark is to them a treasury of eggs, larvae, and cocoons. For them, every ant-tunneled heartwood bulges with milk and honey. We often stand a fresh split against a nearby tree just to see the greedy chicks mop up the ant eggs. It lightens our labor to know that they, as well as we, derive aid and comfort from the fragrant riches of newly split oak. But for the diseases and insect pests, there would likely be no food in these trees, and hence no chickadees to add cheer to my woods in winter. So he's identifying the fact that a lot of creatures rely on snags for food as well as shelter. Many other kinds of wildlife depend on tree diseases. My pileated woodpeckers chisel living pines to extract fat grubs from the diseased heartwood. My barred owls find surcease from crows and jays in the hollow heart of an old basswood. But for this diseased tree, their sundown serenade would probably be silenced. My wood ducks nest in hollow trees. Every June brings its brood of downy ducklings to my woodland slough. All squirrels depend for permanent dens on a delicately balanced equilibrium between a rotting cavity and the scar tissue with which the tree attempts to close the wound. The squirrels referee the contest by gnawing out the scar tissue when it begins to unduly sh to shrink the amplitude of their front door. So he's talking about a hole in a tree, the tree is healing, trying to close that hole, and the squirrel's constantly chewing away at it to keep it open. The real jewel of my disease-ridden woodlot is the prothonotory warbler. He nests in an old woodpecker hole or other small cavity in a dead snag overhanging water. The flash of his gold and blue plumage amid the dank decay of the June woods is in itself proof that dead trees are transmuted into living animals and vice versa. When you doubt the wisdom of this arrangement, take a look at the prothonotary. Just awesome there. I love that, that last line where he says... Uh, the flash of his gold and blue plumage amid the dank decay of the June woods is in itself proof that dead trees are transmuted into living animals and vice versa. He's talking about how a dead dying tree in the woods can actually be transformed into living animals uh, by, by providing really important habitat requirements. Let's really quickly take a look at the, a, a prothonotary, uh, a prothonotary warbler here. Um, just to give you an idea, they are truly a beautiful bird. There you go, and they nest in cavities and trees overhanging water. So throughout this reading, uh, Leopold identifies a few really important features of um, of snags, of dead trees. We call, we call a dead standing tree a snag, right? So he, he identifies a pile of species. You can go through there and, and uh, identify how many total species uh, Leopold describes, ooh, I missed the S there, how many total species uh, does Leopold describe lying on dead and dying trees in his property? And then identify three different ways that snag trees are valuable to wildlife. So if, if we think about it, if you go through this reading here, he mentions um, wildlife utilizing these snags, obviously for food, right? There's a lot of woodpeckers and uh, chickadees he mentions all relying on the insects that live in these dead dying trees. There's a lot of them that rely on them for shelter. He mentions the rough grouse as uh, really relying on these fallen dead limbs at, for shelter, as well as uh, um, barred owls and things like that. And then the last one is reproduction, things like the, the, the prothonotary warbler and the wood duck. Those creatures really rely on cavities and dead standing trees 
uh, for reproduction. So dead standing trees, snags as we call them, are extremely important wildlife habitat. And they're one of these things that people often that don't have an understanding of wildlife may look at and say, geez, uh, that thing is ugly. We got to cut that down, get that out of the woods behind our house. Um, when in reality, they are really, really important wildlife habitat. As a landowner, one of the best things you can do in your woodlot is leave those snags because you're, all you're going to do is increase the biodiversity on your property by doing so. So I really hope that you enjoyed that reading. I love A Mighty Fortress, one of my favorite uh, short stories. And every time I walk through the woods, I always stop and take a look at snags. Um, and it's, it's uh, fun just to, to look at these dead trees in the woods and think about maybe uh, all the different wildlife that might be using that snag. So uh, there you have it. Uh, go ahead and complete your uh, reflection piece today. If you followed along with the video, most of the things that you need to write about have probably been uh, identified in there. And I appreciate your hard work. Uh, as always, shoot me an email with any questions. I'm here to help. And thanks again. We'll see you guys next time.